Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, uh, we are grateful, Lord God, just for your goodness. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that this microphone works. Uh, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, as I recognize, Lord, just coming into uh, to, uh, to the service, Lord, early before uh, the service began, and nothing was working. Uh, Lord, and just praying and just seeking you and just relying upon you and just recognizing we were going to move forward. We were going to do our best. And I thank you for all your servants that came together, Lord, just to, to make this happen. And so, uh, Lord, we give you glory. We know that you have provided this thing to work so that your word can go forth. I pray for those online that they are able to hear and receive and that they have their Bibles before them and they can also follow along. And, and Lord, tonight as always, Lord, I pray that we would never approach a service as a religious ritual. That's not what this is. Lord, we have a relationship with you, and we desire, Lord God, that you would speak to us, and you do that through your word by your spirit. And so, Lord, open our hearts tonight, Lord, as, as we open up our Bibles, Lord, you speak to us and encourage us. We have learned so much from the book of Proverbs, and I know that there's so much more you have for us. And so bless our time now, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, good to see you tonight. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs 26, okay? Proverbs chapter 26. We have been in the book of Proverbs for several months now, and we are headed towards that end. Again, we're eventually going to make it to Proverbs 31 and cover one of the most famous passages in the Bible about the virtuous woman, but we're not there yet. And so tonight we begin chapter 26. And, and uh, if you're taking notes, our goal tonight is to get through verse 11, okay? Proverbs 26, verses 1 through 11 is what, uh, Lord willing, we will get to cover tonight. Now, as I always do, kind of just backing up and reminding everybody what Proverbs is all about. And I do this, again, wanting to make sure if you're a first-timer or if you've been with us from the beginning that you remember why we have this book. It's so important in any book that we have, any book of the Bible, that we understand why it was written. And specifically, Solomon told us at the very beginning, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, he told us that he he put this book together, that he wrote down or recorded these Proverbs that we would know wisdom, okay, and instruction, that we would understand words of insight, okay? That's what this is all about. Now, we defined wisdom, very important, as the practical application of knowledge. In other words, wisdom is not knowledge, Wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge in a way that's going to benefit your life, okay? We all desire to live successful lives. I'm sure all of us do. Well, wisdom from God, found in His, God, found in His Word, is what teaches us how to take the, the knowledge and the information and the data and all the, all the things that we've learned in life and know how to apply them in a way that we can live honorable and godly lives before the Lord. And so that's what this whole book, again, has been all about. Now, we are now in the fifth section, okay? And we've covered so much from the introduction to the Proverbs that Solomon took the time to record. He recorded 375 Proverbs from chapters 10 to 22. And then Solomon also gathered other Proverbs, other wise sayings from other men, from other wise men. And he compiled 77 of them together, which ended chapter 22. And so during Solomon's time, get this, the book of Proverbs ended in chapter 22. But something happened, okay? Something happened. Many years later, when King Hezekiah came along, You might remember King Hezekiah, as a young man, inherited the throne of Israel, specifically the throne of the southern kingdom of Judah, from an ungodly father. An ungodly father who had led the people of Judah away from the Lord. And so here you have this young man, a beautiful example to all young men and women, that we can serve Jesus, that we can make an impact for God. This young man had a desire to lead the people back to God. And so he began spiritual reforms. And one of the reforms was to get people back to studying the word of God. And because it was known that Solomon had written a lot more than 375 Proverbs. Get this, according to 1 Kings 4.32, Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. And so King Hezekiah had his men copy or compile from Solomon's, we would call it, diary. And they began to give us more Proverbs. And that's why the book of Proverbs is longer today. And so if you've been with us in this fifth section, we have been 
studying Hezekiah's collection of Solomon's Proverbs, okay? And we will continue to study all of these additional Proverbs that Solomon wrote through chapter 29. And so let's pick it up again right where we left off last week as we begin a new chapter, chapter 26, and pick it up in verse 1. Solomon had written, Like snow in summer, or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Now what's very important is the word fool. Whenever we read about the word fool in the Bible, okay, very important, it does not refer to someone that is mentally deficient. It does not refer to someone who is physically incapable of learning. The fool that the Bible records are those who have the ability to learn, those who have the capacity to gain wisdom, but they reject it. They reject God and they reject the wisdom from God. Why? Because they want to live how they want to live. They want to believe what they want to believe. They think they know better than God. And so they make themselves fools. Now, King David is very famous for saying in Psalm 14.1, David, who was Solomon's dad, wrote, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Why is a fool a fool? Because from the very beginning, they reject God. And how sad. I want you to think about something. The Bible is very clear that God has given us evidence all around us that reveal that he exists. All we have to do very quickly is just open up your eyes, right? Go to the desert or to the mountains or to the ocean. Look up at the stars. I mean, look at, you know, the sun with sunglasses on. Look at the moon. Look at anywhere you look, right? And you reveal a creator. None of this happened by accident. All of it is too perfect. Too perfect. I've said it many times, right? The first time I seen my first child born, no one had to convince me there was a God. It's too perfect, okay? There is a God. All we have to do is open our eyes. But along with everything around us, all of creation, God has also given us the scriptures, the holy scriptures that reveal that he is true, Prophecy that has been fulfilled. Archaeological evidence from the Old Testament. All of which prove over and over again with certainty that God is true. And so anyone, after all that God has revealed, who still says, eh, there's no God, right? No way. I'd rather believe that we came from monkeys. I'd rather believe that we came from aliens is a fool. And that's what David said, right? Way back long ago, you make yourself a fool if you think you are wiser than God. Now, what's sad about this is I want you to think about something. We live in a society today where this world honors fools. Would you agree with me? Any of you watch the Academy Awards? You have award shows, right? that honor fools. Is that right? That's right. Whether it's athletes, spoiled athletes, right? Make more money than any of us combined, right? And yet complain. Fools. Actors, politicians, I mean, you name it. You have so many people idolizing these people that are bad examples to society. They are poor role models for our children and the future generation, and yet they have award shows, and they're applauded, and they're celebrated, and they give each other trophies as if they're, you know, better than sliced bread, right? That's the world we live in, and it's so sad. And I bring this up because notice again what Solomon says. Solomon says, honor is not fitting for a fool. In other words, a fool does not deserve to be honored. Why? Because foolishness and honor don't go together. Foolishness and honor don't go together. And this is exactly the analogy that Solomon is making. Look back at the verse. Just like snow in summer doesn't go together. You guys see that? Or rain in the harvest time does not go together. So honor and honor foolishness don't go together. You should never honor a fool because a fool doesn't deserve to be honored. Their actions, their opinions do not deserve to be respected. And if we make the mistake of honoring fools, 
we could lead others to believe that the fools deserve honor. And so Solomon makes it very clear, right? Don't do that. Honor or a fool is not worthy of honor. Verse 2. Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless does not alight. Now let me ask you a question, and I think this is kind of funny. How many of you have ever heard someone tell you, don't say that or it'll come true? We heard that before, right? You're like, yeah, grandma. No, blame. don't blame grandma, okay? <laughs> or how about this? Be careful about the words you say because words have power. We've heard those things before, right? We all have. We were raised with stuff like that, right? Like don't sit too close to the TV because your eyes are going to go, right, right? Or don't jump in the pool right after you eat. We've all heard things like this, and we refer to them as superstition. Okay? Superstitions. Well, guess what? The idea that words have power and that if you say something, it's going to happen dates all the way back to ancient times when people believed that if you pronounce a blessing on someone, it will happen. If you pronounce a cursing on someone, it will happen. When those words come out of your mouth, they become they come into existence. That's what they believe. And that's what they have always believed. And what's sad is that when people believe these things, think about how many people throughout the centuries have lived in fear because they believe this is true. Oh, I got to be careful. I can't say that, right? I can't say those words because they're going to become real. But the reality is, the power of either blessing or cursing depends on the person speaking. I'll say it again. The power of blessing or cursing depends on the person speaking. Let me ask you tonight, do any of you have magical powers? Because I don't have any magical powers, right? We don't. And we don't have powers. Our words are, are just words. The only person who has power is the Lord. His words, his blessings, his cursings will come to pass. And so other than him, which we don't have to fear in that way, we don't have to fear anybody, their blessings or, or their cursings. Now we understand that only God has power. Do you know how we know that? Let me ask you a question. When someone sneezes, what do we tell them? What do we tell them? God bless you. You know why we tell them that? Because in ancient times, it was believed that when someone sneezed, it was a sign that they were getting sick and could die. And so you pronounced God's blessing over them, hopefully to keep them from dying. That's where that comes from. Okay? But once again, it all, we all recognize even in that, those words that God has the power, right? It's not us. It's not anybody else. It's God who has the power. And this is what Solomon is clarifying here. Again, look back at the verse. Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless, a curse without a cause, does not alight. Now, what's he talking about? It, almost, it seems a little confusing. Solomon is describing something. How many times have you walked outside and you've seen a bird fly by? All of us, right? We've all done that. That's always happened. We see it fly by, but you know what? We don't know where it's going, and we don't ever see it land. And that's what Solomon is picturing. He says, see, someone might come to you, and think about his time when specifically people were trying to curse, you know, uh, 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 cast spells and curses and all that type of stuff. I guess people still do it today. Solomon was saying, understand that those words are just like a bird flying. They, the words might go into the air, but they, they never land. Just like you never see the bird land. Don't fear. Those curses are not going to land on you just like the sparrow's never going to land on you. And so I love it because he's clarifying the, the superstition. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't fear it. Don't worry. The only one who has power is God. But notice one thing. Let me point something out. Notice that he says a curse that is causeless. In other words, don't ever fear a 
curse that you have not deserved. Okay? That's what he's saying. Don't ever fear a curse that you have not deserved. Now, you should ask the question, but what if I do deserve it? Right? What if I do deserve it? Should you fear it? And the answer is maybe. And I'll tell you why. You should not fear it because the curse has power. You should fear the consequences of your actions because the Bible is clear that everyone is going to reap what they sow. Make sense? It is not the words. It is not the curse. It's the acknowledgement that if you do something wrong, you're going to pay for it. Again, everyone does because that is simply the universal law that God has created known as the law of sowing and reaping. Verse 3. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Now, this is interesting. And whenever I read Proverbs, I'm in the details, okay? And so the details are kind of interesting because notice, a whip for the horse and a bridle for the donkey. Now, that's kind of weird. Why? Because today, we don't put bridles on donkeys. We put bridles on horses. You guys with me? But in ancient times, in ancient times, the common person could not afford a horse. They only had mules. So they put bridles on mules back then. And it was rare to have a horse. Only the kings had horses. It was rare to have a horse. And if somehow you were able to get your hands on a horse, the likelihood was that it was unbroken. It was untrained. And so if you were able to get a horse, you would have to whip it to get it under control. And this is what he is describing. Now, in either cases, right, whether it be a horse or a donkey, whether it be with a whip or a bridle, Solomon's point is that you need a tool to control the animal, okay? You need a tool to control the animal. Why? Because the animal, for the most part, cannot understand verbal instruction. And so the only way to control them is by physical force. That's what you must do. That is the only language they will understand. An animal will understand. And so Solomon, again, using this picture, says what? In the same way that because an animal is not smart enough to understand verbal instruction, you need a tool to control it because a fool is not smart enough to understand verbal instruction instruction. You need a tool as well. We would say it this way, to whip them into shape, okay? And this is exactly what he's talking about. He talks about a rod or a stick used to correct their foolishness. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be hit with a stick. Does that make sense? Right? Or a rod or anything else for that matter. And so this is kind of a warning to us. And I think it's, it's a good warning. I think it's a good warning to to instruct our, our children. God has given us the ability and the choice to learn from his word. That we can learn instruction. That we can learn wisdom from the words that he has given us in the scriptures. And if we do, we won't have to experience suffering and pain. We won't have to experience, right, the, uh, the correction on our backside. But if we don't respond, if we choose to reject God's word, reject God's instruction, then we might have to experience that corrective discipline or punishment necessary to get us back under control. It's for this reason that King David, King David wrote in Psalm 32, 9, he says, do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control, right? Lord, help us not to act like animals, but to be smart, to be wise, to follow the instructions the Lord has given us so that we do not have to be punished or corrected. Verse 4 and 5, answer not a fool. If you have a pen, underline those words or highlight them. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool. Underline those words and highlight them as well. According to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. 
Now, I put these two verses together. Why? Because they almost seem like a contradiction. You guys with me? How many of you know there's no contradictions in the Bible? There are just things that we need to understand. Many people will read this and at first read, think to themselves, wait a minute, Solomon is contradicting himself. The word of God is contradicting itself. But what Solomon is trying to get across here, get this, is that when we address foolish people, we need to know how to do it, but we also need to know when to do it. Does that make sense? how to do it, and when to do it. And this is exactly what Solomon is trying to get across. Notice first, Solomon writes that we should not answer a fool in their foolishness. Because if we do, and we get into it with them, and we start arguing with them, eventually we're going to look foolish as well. And so he says, answer not a fool. Now this is important, and I think this is especially important for us today. How many of you on social media read the comments on social media, right? We read the blogs, and we do. And let me tell you, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is that you're on, oftentimes, if you're reading different things, you come across some of the dumbest, Lord help me, and foolish comments out there, okay? Or maybe it's just me, but that, I'm telling you, and sometimes I'm just like, mm. And I want, to, yeah, I want my thumbs to do the talking. You guys with me? Because you read things and the foolish things, and serious, I'm sorry, but the dumb things that people are saying today, oh Lord, I mean, there's not a better word that I can think of other than foolish. And so oftentimes, whether you're on social media or you're at work or school or wherever you are, and you're in a conversation and people say something or they voice an opinion and it's just dumb. And you immediately, if you're like me, you're ready to respond. You're ready to correct them. You're ready to tell them they're wrong. And that happens a lot. Again, at least it, it happens to me. And so we need to understand, should we always do that? Should we always respond? And this is what Solomon is addressing. If you're taking notes, write this down. When you find yourself in that place and you feel like you should respond and you even want to respond, there are two things that you should consider before you do. Okay, write this down. I thought it was good. Number one, is what they said even important? Is what they said even important and worth getting, worth getting in an argument over? That's the first question you should ask. Is this even important? Is this worth ruining my day, right? Here's the second thing. Is the person you want to respond to, are they even open to correction? Because oftentimes people's minds are made up. You can show them all the facts in the world and they'll still tell you, uh-uh. People there are just set in their ways. They're going to believe what they believe no matter what. People that are, I would say, they're, they're straight brainwashed. And so you have to consider, how about, let me throw something else at you. How about you come across someone who's drunk? Are they, are they available or, or even capable of receiving correction? Not in that state. And so, again, you have to consider these two things. Number one, is it even important and worth getting in an argument over? Number two, is the person even open or in a proper state to receive correction? Because if it's not important or the person is not open to correction, if you try to argue with them, if you try to correct them, you're going to end up wasting your time, right? Because they're not open. Or they're not capable of receiving correction. And oftentimes, and I'm sure it's happened, right? It's happened to me. You start getting into it with someone. And before you know it, you sink down to their level. And you become a fool just like they are. And so don't do it. Okay, when you recognize, number one, it's not important. Or it's not gonna, they're not open. They're not gonna, you're not going to get anywhere. Don't bother responding to a fool because you're going to end up making a fool out of yourself. You're going to end up wasting your time. But then, 
we come to verse 5, right? And verse 5 said that we are to answer a fool, okay? And so the question is, when, in what case, when should this happen? How many of you would agree, and hopefully you understand this, when, when, I, when I do uh, you know, premarital uh, counseling or even postmarital counseling, right? One of the things that I share with couples is what? Not everything is worth fighting about. Is that right? Not everything is worth arguing about. Is that right, couples? Come on, right? You're like, yes, no, no, okay? Not everything is not, unless you want to be unhappy every day, unless you want to go to bed, you know, on the couch every night, it's not worth it, okay? But there are certain hills that we have to die on. Does that make sense? But there are certain things, I'm sorry, we have to talk about. I just can't let this go. And this is what Solomon is talking about. There are times when someone says something that is foolish and ridiculous. And it's too important. You have to address it. You cannot let them go on thinking that they are right. You have to say something. You have an obligation to speak the truth. It's only the truth that's going to set them free, right? Now, you might say, but what if they're not open? It doesn't matter especially in a crowd, right? When there's younger people, you have to deal with it. Otherwise, you remain silent and you can allow them to influence other people, okay? Very, very important. One of the interesting things I, I learned a long time ago as a Christian, I remember, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses coming and knocking on my door. You guys ever, that happened? Hasn't ha I, I don't even know if they're still out there. I don't even know, but they, there was a time when they were out there. I haven't seen it, I honestly, I don't even remember the last time I seen a Jehovah's Witness. Hopefully they all got saved. I don't know. But <laughs> anyways, one of the things that, that they would do, right, is if you know, if they still do it, is they always come with a, a new believer and an older believer. They always do. Every time they come to your door, it's always two. And they do that on purpose. It's training. Every time, it was always training. And I recognize that from the very beginning. And so what I would do, again, is... Some would, you know, I know some Christians that, no, nah, I just slammed the door on them. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I engaged them. And I would, as I was speaking, I'd be looking in the eyes of the young person because I wanted them to know the truth, okay? The older person's mind might be made up. Hopefully not, but most of the times probably yes. And so I needed to speak the truth so that young person would have those seeds planted in their mind. And that's why there are times, again, hills to die on. You have to speak the truth. You have to say something. And this is exactly, again, what Solomon is talking about. There's a time not to say anything because it's not going to get anywhere and it's not that important anyways. But there are other times when you have to say something. You have to speak the truth. You can't let that fool think that they're right. You say something. You speak the truth. You plant the seeds in their mind and pray for them. And hopefully one day... Those seeds you planted, right, will cause them to come to the truth. I love this because, you know, this reminds me that life is complicated, isn't it? It's not like a one shoe, fit, one shoe fits all in every circumstance, right? We have to be wise. We have to understand these things so we know what to do and what not to do and when to do it and when not to do it. Let's move on. Verse 6. Whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Now, talk about a weird proverb, huh? I want you to think about ancient times, specifically back then. In ancient times, no cell phone, no internet, right? No texting, no beepers, no nothing, right? If you needed to get a message out, you had to send a messenger. Now, imagine you're a king. Solomon is a king, remember, as he's writing these proverbs. And in those days, right, you're in your city, your city is surrounded, you're protected, but let's say you receive word that an enemy army is headed your way. Well, you would immediately dispatch a messenger, right, to get out there to go to one of your neighboring allies to send help, to send another army. And this is the picture that Solomon is describing. He says, whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet, and drinks violence. Now, if you're about to send a messenger in a life-and-death situation, how many of you would agree it's not a good idea to send a fool? That's what he's saying. Don't do that. 
And the analogy he gives, right, is that not only can you not depend on his feet, the fool's feet, but if you are dumb enough to send a fool, you might as well cut your own feet off, drink poison, and then you yourself try to go and deliver that message. That's what he's describing. He says, because you're going to get the same result. The fool is not going to deliver the message, and there's no way if you've cut your feet off and drunk poison, are you going to be able to get that message out? And so don't do it, okay? This is what he's talking about. It's interesting, but this is what he is talking about. If you are foolish enough to rely on a fool, don't depend on a fool, he says. Otherwise, you're just going to inflict harm on yourself. You're going to do it to yourself. You might as well shoot yourself in your own foot. That's what he means. Verse 7. Like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Now, when you think about a lame man or a crippled man, a crippled person, you recognize their legs are of no use to them. And Solomon likens the uselessness of their legs to the uselessness of a fool speaking a proverb. Okay? He's a fool, which means a fool, remember, rejects God. If he rejects God, he rejects the wisdom from God. In other words, he doesn't believe it's wisdom. He doesn't believe in the proverb. He doesn't believe that if he practices is it and obeys the Lord, that blessing will come from it. And so he doesn't believe in the words he speaks. His words are useless. If he doesn't believe it, would anyone else believe what he has to say? No. It's useless, and that's exactly what he is describing. Verse 8, like one who binds the stone in the sling is one who gives honor to a fool. Now, if you have the ESV, if you're reading from the English Standard Version, I want you to notice that starting in verse 7 through verse 11, all of the Proverbs begin with the word like. You guys see that? Now, the word like is, a, is used for comparison's sake. And so all of these Proverbs are, he's comparing things. He's comparing one thing to another. And he continues here in verse 8. And he talks about a stone in a sling, or we would call it a slingshot. Now, how many of you would agree that Solomon probably knew something about slingshots? Does that make sense? Why? Because his dad was the king of the slingshots, wasn't he, right? He killed Goliath with a slingshot. And so I love it. He, he, he knows what he's talking about. And he says, like someone who binds or ties a stone in the sling. Now, let me ask you, if you've ever used a slingshot, you don't tie the stone or the pebble or the rock or whatever it is, you don't tie it to the sling. You place it in the pouch, don't you? pull back, and then you let it go. Can you imagine you tying it or fastening the rock or the pebble to the sling? Is it going to go anywhere? No. You're, you're defeating the purpose, okay? That's what he's describing. How dumb that would be. We'd say it this way. How foolish that would be. That doesn't make any sense. Why would someone do that? Well, that's Solomon's point. Again, someone who binds the stone in the sling is like someone who gives honor to a fool. No one should give honor to a fool. We've already covered it because fools don't deserve it. It doesn't make any sense. Verse 9. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. How many of you like to garden or do landscaping? I think that's a good thing. That's a good practice, right? I'm not very good, but I do find enjoyment. I still mow my own lawns and trim my own bushes, right? And if you've done that, any, any of us, right, you know what it feels like to get pricked by thorns. Pretty bad? For whatever reason, Lord help me, I never use gloves, okay? And it's like, you know, it's like I'm too lazy to go get the gloves. I'm just like, I'm just going to do it real quick. And I pick myself every time, right? And it hurts. We know how that feels. Well, with that picture in mind, notice, he describes a drunk person, a, someone who's intoxicated, right? A drunkard 
who has a branch of thorns in their hand. You would say, not a good picture, right? Not a good picture. If just being around or trimming bushes will get you hurt, imagine holding a branch full of thorns when you're drunk, okay? No good. Not only is that drunk person going to injure himself, but it'll probably injure other people, right? And that's what Solomon is describing. Notice, a thorn that goes up into the hand, or thorn branch, or thorn bush that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is like a proverb in the mouth of fools. Once again, a fool rejects God, rejects his wisdom, doesn't understand the proverbs. How can he speak them? He's going to make a fool out of himself speaking about something he doesn't understand. But not only that, if people listen to him, they're going to learn something wrong because he's going to misinterpret the proverb. And it's interesting because, again, you see the comparison? The drunk person with thorns hurts himself and hurts others in the same way that a fool speaking proverbs makes a fool out of himself and will lead others astray. He'll teach them something wrong. A couple more. Verse 10. Like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. Now again, if you have the New King James Version, you're going to find this verse a little differently. If you happen to be someone with that New King James Bible, you will notice at the beginning of this verse an asterisk, okay? Or a footnote. And in the footnote, it states that the Hebrew is difficult to translate. And it was very difficult in making sense of the words, converting them into English. And so let me share with you again what most scholars believe the idea is in the proverb, okay? He seems to speak about an archer who shoots his arrows at random, okay? He's not really looking anywhere. He's just kind of randomly shooting his arrows. And because he's not really paying attention, he's just randomly shooting his arrows, he ends up inflicting pain on others, which is going to bring consequence to himself, okay? Now, with that picture in mind, notice, likewise is one who hires a passing fool or someone who's simply passing by or a drunkard. Now, if any of you have ever hired someone to do work on your house or your car or whatever it might be or one of your appliances or whatever it is, how many of you would agree that it's probably a good idea to find someone who knows what they're doing. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe they got a little experience, right? You don't want to go up to them and say, hey, can you do this? And they go, I think I can. That's not a good thing, right? You want to make sure that whoever you're hiring, you're the employer now, that they have some experience, that they have some knowledge. They are not foolish or ignorant about the work you are hiring them to do. You also don't want to hire a complete stranger who you don't know, you can't trust, and you don't even know if they know what they're doing. It's not a good idea. If you do, what's going to happen? You're going to if you hire someone at random, like the archer shooting at random, you're going to probably get yourself in trouble. That person can come and break something or make something worse. I remember last year, you guys, I, I shared it with you guys. You guys might remember. It happened on a Wednesday, and I remember because we had service later in the night. And so I couldn't get a hold of my plumber, and I'm calling him, and I'm calling him, and he's not answering. Find out later he was under a house, but I, he's answering, and my uh, bathtub, right, my, my shower was filled. And it's like, I know, i got to take a shower and, and go to church in a couple hours, and so I'm trying to get a hold of him, trying to get a hold of him, can't get a hold of him. So I just kind of pick up the phone book and, you know, just call, you know, Manny Moe and Jack or whoever it was, right? And this guy comes over, and he goes, yeah, yeah I can fix it, no problem. And so he comes into my bathtub. This is a lesson for everyone, okay? Come, and he starts snaking my bathtub, right? And I'm watching him because he's making me nervous just the way he's handling his tools. And I'm watching him, and all of a sudden, I hear, and he 
jammed the snake so hard that he broke through the pipe under my bathtub, okay? And so all of a sudden, we hear all, and the bathtub was full, all the water falling under my house, like a waterfall. And he looks at me, and he says, do you have a crawl space? We need to look at this right away. And so there we are trying to get to the crawl space, right? And I got to teach in a few hours, by the way. This is all going on in my head, right? And he looks at it, and he goes, ah, he gets down there with a flashlight, and he makes all these things, and he says, you know what? I can fix it, but it's going to be about $2,000. And I'm like, you broke it. You broke it, and you're going to charge me 2000 bucks." And he was like dead serious. So let me make a few phone calls, but I, I can handle this. And I'm like, dude, I need this fixed. I got to take a shower. I got to go to church, you know, like that kind of thing. And so I'm like, Lord, what do I do? Thank the Lord. My plumber calls. He was like, I was under the house, you know. And so long story short, he comes, fixed it for 500 bucks, okay? And so what's the moral to the story? Don't hire someone that if you don't know if they know what they're doing, right? I mean, this guy could have cost me $2,000. I mean, if that's what, right? If I say, hey, go ahead, just fix it, you know? And how scary when we're in a hurry, sometimes we do that, right? Just go ahead, fix it. Be careful, Solomon says. Be, don't just hire someone at random. You could cause more pain than good. Let's look at our last verse, and, and this is the one I was most excited about. It might sound familiar. Verse 11. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Now that should sound a little familiar because we find it also repeated in the New Testament. Now I don't want to be gross, but I want you to picture very quickly, right, what he's talking about. I want you to notice this is the last of the like Proverbs, right, in the series. This is the last one. He's making comparisons. He says, just like a dog that vomits on the floor, throws up on the floor. If you have a dog, I'm sure you've seen this happen, right? I have. After they throw up on the floor, they walk back up to it and they lick it on back up, okay? I know it's gross, forgive me, but that's what happens, right? They're dogs. Now that's important to remember, they are dogs. Solomon says, interesting, in the same way that a dog returns to his vomit, notice a fool returns to his foolishness. And he's describing a person who is a fool who maybe stopped acting a little foolish for a little while. Maybe they were trying to wise up, but it didn't last long because eventually they went back and returned to their foolishness. Now get this, this is important. Why would a fool do that? Why would a fool return back to his or her foolishness? The same reason a dog would do what a dog does, because it is in their nature, okay? That's very important. It's very powerful tonight. Very important. It is in their nature to do. Now, remember that. Now, Peter would later go on to quote this verse, and let me show that to you. In 2 Peter 2.20, Peter describes something, a very powerful passage, if you don't know this passage. He says, for if, if. It's a condition. For if after they, speaking of people, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, someone again entangles themselves, or they are again entangled in them in sin and overcome, he says the last state has become worse for them than the first. Many of you might have met people before who maybe for a time started coming to church, started calling themselves a Christian. And then eventually they went back to the world that didn't last, and they were worse than they were before they started coming to church. I remember talking to someone, and they told me, I got to make up for it. I literally had someone tell me that. I'm going to party even more now. I got to make up for for the time I lost. And I was like, wow. But this is what he's describing. Notice, keep going. Verse 21, for it would have been better for them, for that person, never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing better, after knowing about the Lord, for them to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. 
Verse 22, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, the pig, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire, in the mud. Now, this is very interesting. Let me explain why. I want you to notice that Peter is describing people who at one time claimed to be Christian, claimed to be followers of Christ. They acknowledge Jesus, right? They came to church, but then they went right back to sin. And interesting, Peter um, describes this scenario because we all get it. We've all seen this, but he compares it to Solomon's proverb. He compares those people to a dog returning to their vomit and a pig returning to the mud. Are you guys with me? This is interesting. And you have to ask the question, why did he do this? Because he's describing people, again, who professed to be Christians. They joined the church. They said they were saved. And so many of us know people, have met people, and we've witnessed this. We've seen this. They came for a while, a year, six months, maybe a couple years. But then they went right back to the world, right back to sin, right back to their old lifestyle. And the question is, what happened? What happened to them? Well, we know what happened. They were trying to do things in their own strength. They were trying to serve God in their own power, but they never surrendered to God. They never repented of their sins. They never gave their life to Christ and truly recognized Jesus as their Lord. And so they were trying to do it in their own strength. And eventually you get tired, don't you? And then Satan comes along, and he tempts them, and the attacks come, and eventually, again, because they are only strong for so long, they give in to their old temptation, and they go back to their old ways. Now, when this happens, and notice, it's happened all the way from the beginning. Notice that? Peter addressed it, because it was happening during his time. Whenever that happens, get this, whenever we see that happen to someone, how often have we referred to them as backsliders? Do you know they're not backsliders? We call them backsliders. I've heard many people say they're backsliders. They're backsliders. But it's important to understand that the scenario Peter's describing does not apply to backsliders because these are people that were never truly saved in the first place. In order to be a backslider, you have to, again, back away from the Lord, from the relationship you were walking with the Lord. But these people, those people that, again, walk away and literally go back to an old sinful lifestyle, demonstrate they were never truly saved at all. Why did they go back? Because when you get saved, you are given a new nature, aren't you? You will follow that new nature. But until you are saved, you have the old sinful nature. And eventually, like the dog who follows his nature, the unsaved will follow their same old sinful nature. This is what Peter is explaining. This is why he quotes the proverb. And what's interesting about it, here's the clue. Do you notice that Peter refers to these people that attended church, claim that they were church, but are now living in their sinful lifestyle. Peter refers to them as dogs and pigs. You guys get that? Is that what he did? How many of you understand that the Bible never refers to believers as dogs or pigs? The Bible refers to believers as what? Sheep. Okay? Very, very important. So these people were never saved. Now think about a sheep. Do sheep eat their own vomit? No. Do sheep wallow in the mud? No. Now does it mean a sheep can't fall in the mud? Of course it can fall in the mud. But will it stay in the mud? No. 
a sheep will get up and get out of there. Why? Because it is not in the sheep's nature to be in the mud. If someone is truly saved, they have a new nature. They are a sheep. They might fall. They might stumble. They might get dirty. We all do. But we won't stay there. We will go right back, right? We will get out of there. A pig, on the other hand, is going to stay in the mud, isn't it? Because that's the pig's nature. How many of you love the story of the prodigal son? What happened in the prodigal son? Prodigal son left his father, didn't he, for a time? He finds himself in the mud with the pigs? Does he stay in the mud with the pigs? No. Why? Because he was a son. The pig stayed in the mud. The son got up out of the mud. And he returned to the father because he was a son. Now, what a lesson, right, for all of us. Because this explains what we see. We see it happen. We see people that, again, we know, people we love, and we wish they were saved. But the reality is, actions speak louder than words. We demonstrate who we are by how we live. If someone is truly a believer, they will return back to the Lord. Always remember that. If someone is truly a believer, they will return back to the Lord. But if someone stays in the mud, then they prove that they are not a believer. They were only a make-believer. What a powerful verse. Amen? We'll pick it up next week in verse 12. Let's pray. Once again, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, Lord God. Thank you for its truth. What a powerful verse, again, to close with, Lord. Just that reminder, Lord, that we, all of us, are to examine our hearts, Lord God, and to recognize, Lord God, who we are. Do we have that new nature? A nature that desires to live for you, to follow after you. You say, your sheep hear your voice. Or... Do we still have that old nature, that old nature that wants to wallow in the mud, that old nature that has not been changed yet, that still practices sin? Lord, help us. It's one thing to fall, to make mistakes, to sin. It's a whole other thing to live in a sinful lifestyle. Give us wisdom, Lord God. Help us to recognize who we are. And I pray, Lord, for anyone, Lord God, struggling that we would be reminded that you're there for all of us, that you love all of us, Lord God, that all of these things recorded for us are for our learning, for our instruction, that we again would hold these verses to ourselves like, like we look into a mirror and allow you again to show us who we are and bring us to that place where we would cry out to and recognize just how much we need you. Thank you tonight for your love. Thank you for your wisdom. Lord, help us to take these things and be more than just hearers. Help us to be doers. As always, we're careful to give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up.